friends, colleagues, ladies and gentlemen. No, no, Good we morning. Haven't, we haven't begun yet. I'll, I'll oh. give you another warning before okay. we start. Just about okay, let me... one more minute or so. Okay. So what are you going to, what are you going to do to make... I'll, I'll tell you right before I start it. Fantastic. Thank you so much. Okay, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to press start now. Um, just give it about 30 seconds before the session, just so uh, you begin speaking. Uh, but I'm pressing start now, so everything from this point on will be live. Friends, colleagues, ladies and gentlemen, good morning, good afternoon, and good evening, wherever you may be. I welcome you to the United Nations Global Compact side event on responsible business at the forefront of South-South and Triangular Cooperation. My name is Ola Jobi Makinwa. I'm Chief Intergovernmental Relations at the UN Global Compact. This virtual event is being held as part of uh, the global, uh, uh, this virtual event is being held within the three-day Global South-South Development Expo 2022. We hope that through this event, we are able to demonstrate the inclusive and diverse nature of South-South and triangular cooperation. Let me start with a few housekeeping line terms. This session is being recorded and will be made available on the UN Global Compact's YouTube page. For our panelists, please mute your microphones when not speaking. We invite participants to write questions in the chat box during the event. We will try to address them during the Q&A portion. Excellencies, ladies and gentlemen, dear friends, dear colleagues, it's an honor for me to speak today at the Global Compact's virtual event on responsible business at the forefront of South-South and Triangular Corporation. Let me first thank the government of the Kingdom of Thailand, the Economic and Social Commission for Asia and the Pacific, and the United Nations Office for South-South Corporation for their vision and leadership in holding the first GSSD Expo in the Asia Pacific region. Now, although South-South Corporation has traditionally been viewed as member state driven, the private sector holds the key to unlocking resources and diffusing values that recognize the role of technical cooperation among developing countries for initiating, designing, organizing and promoting cooperation so that they can create, acquire, adapt, transfer and pool knowledge and experience for their mutual benefit and for achieving national and collective self-reliance. Moreover, the experience of the COVID-19 pandemic has shown us that triangular cooperation calls for an enhanced scale and scope of cooperation from Northern partners as traditional economic and developmental categorizations become less relevant as the world becomes increasingly interconnected and interdependent. Countries of the South have contributed to more than half of the world's growth in recent years with intra-South trade being higher than ever and accounting for more than a quarter of all world trade. As the world's largest corporate sustainability initiative, the UN Global Compact, in partnership with other UN actors, stands ready to help countries of the South in their development aspirations by mobilizing private businesses committed to sustainability through the 10 principles of the Global Compact and in the achievement of the Sustainable Development Goals. For example, in the Asia and the Pacific region, ESCAP's Sustainable Business Network requires all corporate members to sign up to the 10 principles of the UN Global Compact on human rights, labor, the environment, and anti-corruption, thereby leading to more local level engagement and collaboration. The most recent of which was the Uniting Business Live event in June, 
where five global compact local networks from the ASEAN region exchange insights on issues such as climate change, social sustainability, the growth of the SME sector, and biodiversity. What you will hear this morning will be tangible contributions of how responsible businesses can be a force for good in not only diffusing skills and technical know-how, but also the values needed to tackle issues such as food security, climate, and energy. I would like to wish you a successful exchange of ideas and constructive discussions. Thank you. Thank you very much indeed, uh, A.S. Giambo. We've just heard from uh, the CEO of the UN Global Compact, ASG Sandau Diambo. So we thank her for her insightful remarks. Uh, moving on, let us proceed with the leadership dialogue. We'll be hearing from UN Global Compact participants today. We will also hear from our local networks and from the UN Global Compact office about how responsible business can play a critical role in the fight to end poverty. Through the creation of sustainable jobs, foster economic activity through their supply chains and contribute tax revenues for basic services and infrastructure, particularly in the quest to build back better from the coronavirus COVID-19 pandemic. I now invite Ms. Manal Hassan. I hope she's here with us already, Group Chief Sustainability Officer of, of Elswidi Electric Egypt. Uh, please over to you, Ms. Hassan, if you're already with us this evening. I can't seem, okay. Um, if Ms. Hazan is not with us, may I please give the floor to Mr. Theodoros Deocares, Vice President for Supply Chain Fruit Group of Abolis, Philippines, to discuss sustainable regional supply chains. So Mr. Theodoro Deocares, over to you. Hello. Uh, good morning, everyone. Thank you, Ms. Olajobi, for the introduction. So I'll be sharing my screen already. And uh, just advise me if you can view it already. So this will just be a five-minute presentation based on the allocation of time for us. So I'll try to squeeze <laughs> as much information as I can for this presentation. OK, so can everyone see my screen? OK, good. So the main topics that I'll be discussing is all about regional supply chain and of course, corporate sustainability. Okay, so I'll first start uh, the 1FG, which is the One Food Group business overview. Okay, so that you know what our businesses are in terms of the private sector and our sustainability focus. So we'll start first with the initiatives and challenges afterwards, okay? So in terms of the 1FG business overview, uh, we have this particular timeline, okay? So the Aboitis group of companies uh, has a division called the Food Group. And the Food Group is represented by Pilmico Foods Corporation and started the food industry in 1962. And of course, come in the late 90s, we started venturing with other American partners of feeds and farms production. And uh, we also commenced operations of our feed mill and farm mill in 1999 and 2000 immediately. And of course, following the 2009, okay, the far plant we have is in the south of the Philippines. So we ventured some of our feed mill as well in the north and even in the south. So we had that national presence in the Philippines. And in 2018, we acquired gold coin, which has a regional presence in Asia, okay, which you will see later on. So in all of this acquisition and partnership, Aboitis maintained and acquired 100% of their shares for these businesses. So you can see the diversity of the businesses for one food group, okay? And of course, uh, through this, uh, we also would like to tell you that uh, food is the third largest subsidiary or component of the Aboitis and Company. The number one is power. So we're venturing in both renewable and non-renewable resources. And that comprise around 70 to 75% of our um, of chop pie. And then we also have banking in the Philippines and food, okay? So, you know, before actually looking into the, the three components below, um, we have the 1FG Vision, which is an integrated regional agribusiness and food company 
and our mission is really on feeding humanity, okay? And of course, in terms of functionality, the mission and vision we have for the supply chain is to become the most cost-efficient, effective, and sustainable supply chain uh, provider or solution so that with the mission of really building that partnerships with our partners in terms of our customers, suppliers, communities, and even the public sector and the NGOs in general. So in terms of us showing to you how regional we are, uh, the strong presence in Asia uh, that we have uh, tells us that we have 29 facilities in nine countries, and these are stated down below, okay? And to show you how these are all linked together in terms of cross-border uh, collaboration. So we have here um, the several countries that we have in which these are the plants that we have in this Asian uh, region. And Vietnam usually supplies uh, most of our pet food for Philippines, Brunei, Malaysia, and Indonesia. So we also have specialty nutrition for our additives for our feed meal, and even some of our vitamin premixes. We also have the particular aqua feeds. So we have the flour exports from our flour mill in 1962, which was built, and of course our shrimp feeds. And all of this really shows to you the complexity of the supply chains we are actually having, okay? And this is actually the current. And wait, once we see the future, okay? So the future says five to 10 years time. So you see how interconnected and intricate the supply chain uh, becomes, and it's not as linear as most textbooks would show to us, okay? So with this kind of messiness that we are encountering, we have to be very, very connected together. That's why, um, we also aim to be integrated in terms of our food company. So in terms of our integration, uh, these are all that we have for our SKUs, for our um, finished goods. So for flour, we're producing the hard wheat, soft wheat, and specialty flour. And of course, we have the feeds, livestock, aqua, specialty pet food, which was shown a while ago. And for farms, this is specifically intrinsic for the Philippines. We have hogs, eggs, and meats. And for trading, we also trade some of our raw materials and even some of our baking ingredients and some commodity solutions, okay? And then the strategic growth and blueprint that we're looking at is, really, is regionalizing our protein footprint and integration into consumer product, which means that we are trying to go downstream as we get nearer to the customers. And of course, partnerships and acquisitions, as if there are opportunities in other countries as well to engage and acquire some of the food companies, because it's only in the Philippines where we had the food component. For the other countries in Asia, it's just for the feeds business, okay? And of course, we now go to the sustainability focus of 1FG, okay? So in terms of our um, 1FG supply chain sustainability, uh, right after the acquisition, we are engaged in, in, in particular synergies with one another. So one of that synergies is really diversity and inclusion of suppliers within 1FG. So what this means is we share suppliers, uh, our database, the manufacturers and skills from other 1FG countries. So this means cross-fertilization of ideas, of resources, so that we can leverage in terms of our resources and even with our capabilities. And we also have to be conscious of high performing cross-functional supply chain. So what this means is we have really to minimize transportation costs. That's why we have created the 1FG supply chain team so that they could really analyze in terms of routes, in terms of movements within country or within islands too cross-country uh, transportation. And in this way, you could analyze which ones would minimize in terms of the carbon footprint and even you know, uh, give you a, a lower costs, essentially. And then we're also doing about sustainable packaging here in the Philippines, which we aim to replicate in other countries. So we're meeting with uh, suppliers of biodegradable products so that this can be emulated in other countries. Although right now we are still in the design and um, talking phase with the suppliers with regards to this. And of course, upskilling and certifications of personnel on their supply chains so that they are very well aware that the literature in journals, in textbooks, and even in several bodies of knowledge point out the rationale for sustainability in the future. Okay, that's why they will be aware. Ah, okay, so this is a very important component and they will be educated on the value of sustainability. 
And of course, again, technology for ERP and end-to-end -end handling. Uh, a digital supply chain is an essential tool for sustainable supply chain. That's why it's very, very important that we uh, tap on the power of technology, especially for those energy reduction technology. So we are now uh, in talks as well with some of our OEM providers in terms of moisture control, pelletizing, which would really aim to reduce energy consumption in the long run. And of course, uh, we are also venturing and even uh, revamping our old ERP to transition into the new ERP so that our functionalities, our capabilities are intertwined together and we could extract that data and meaning so that it would show to us that we will engage in this type of strategy, which would really minimize wastes. Waste in terms of motion, in terms of movements, and even in terms of um, you know tons of uh, wastes, which would emanate from inefficiencies resulting from fragmented technological solutions. And of course, um, we should have governance in terms of strategic prioritization on sustainability. That's why uh, we are also very happy that uh, for the Aboitis conglomerate, we started the. Uh, 2020 initiative of building the ESG team because we are really a very new company in terms of sustainability, unlike in the other multinational companies like Procter and Gamble, Unilever. You know, they started all of this, you know, 15 years ago. But for the other private sectors like ourselves, we're starting to catch up in terms of this. That's why uh, they're also very active, the team, in incorporating some of the departmental KPR and increasing linkages between and among countries and private and public sectors. However, you know, these strategies are easier said than done because there are challenges that we are being faced. First is since we are several countries, there are regulatory changes specifically uh, related to COVID in which we cannot, you know, interchange or exchange uh, ideas physically or even some of the knowledge that can be brought forth easier when we are face to face, okay? And also there are other countries in which it's locked down, we cannot face it, and that cross fertilization of ideas get hampered as well. And another challenge is of course, cultural language and operational nuances, uh, especially the culture and language, even though we're in the same region, we exhibit different um, types of characteristics which of course could lead to potential conflicts. But in the end, um, you know, as long as we are in the um, shared objective of sustainability, I think it would tie in the end, okay? And uh, of course, operational nuances because it depends on what type of SKUs what, that we produce, what type of customers, even the geographical landscape of each country is very different. So it's really very difficult to really institute some of these sustainability initiatives. And of course, we have different levels of maturity. Okay, so for the for the entire food group, Philippines actually leads the maturity in terms of ESG, but for the other countries, uh, they're non-existent. So you see, so we have to really influence and shape our ESG initiative for the one food group to really uh, influence all others to follow suit in terms of our pursuit of sustainability. And of course, uh, you know, I'm also happy to announce that for this year, we have already included sustainability as our shared advocacy of Filmico and even extend it to our customers. Okay. And then of course, just to show you what we've done in terms of sustainability for 2021, we have already established the governance structure, completed the materiality assessments and even developed data collection templates as part of our AEB requirement for data compliance for our KPI. And for 2022, we have to incorporate that sustainability strategy for one food group. Okay, And then, of course, I don't want to have to go through this, but nonetheless, these are the immediate uh, plans that we have for the next three years. So that uh, for this year, we're looking at the maturity index and we'll have to review the materiality assessment, the scores, and even review our progress for the 10 year goals for 2024, because each of the business units here in the country has their 10 year goals, okay? And the 10 year goals has to be linked with sustainability. And of course, this is really how we are being done that in terms of what 
This is what we're currently doing on sustainability. So we have essential nutrients for fortification in products, vitamin E, folic acid, and even vitamin A and iron, which is mandated by the government. We also ensure in terms of our farms, biosecurity, alternative raw materials, which are environmental friendly, and even ISO 14001 for our laboratory, and even the safety and the wellness of our employees, okay? And that's the what. But the modality in terms of where we are heading, we also map it out. So in terms of comply, manage, but I think for our team, we are between comply and manage. So we're still quite far off from the transform level that we want to achieve. But of course, the, the, the thing that would tie us together is our why, which is we want to tell the one FG sustainability story while fulfilling our mission to feed humanity. Okay, so I think that ends my presentation. Uh, I hope um, I did justice for the five minutes. And uh, back to you, Harold or Ms. Olajobi. Thank you. Thank you very much indeed, uh, Mr. Diokaris. And as you can see, when we started, I was having some technical issues here uh, from you know my I, my laptop was not working very well. So uh, yes, indeed. Thank you very much indeed for that fantastic presentation. We will uh, continue now, but before I invite the next uh, speaker, um, I will actually uh, again invite our participants to post questions in the chat. Our team, you know, they're collect collecting right now so that we can respond to them during the Q&A session. At this stage, I'm now going to call on the next speaker. I invite Mr. Faris Pranawa, Director of Public Finance, Financing and Project Development. PT Sarana Multi Infrastructure to speak about the importance of South South and triangular cooperation in sustainable national infrastructure development in Indonesia. We have heard from the Philippines. Now we're going to hear from Indonesia. So over to you, sir. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Ms. Joby, for your kind introduction. Uh, I'm really happy to be here uh, to share our experience and uh, maybe uh, give uh, inspiration to other countries, to other participants, uh, based on our story on how we uh, tackle the challenge and uh, creating innovation uh, to address uh, infrastructure financing needs and to achieve a sustainable uh, development goal. Uh, I didn't uh, prepare any presentation, but I hope uh, I can share our experience. Uh, uh, we, our company, are established uh, 13 years ago uh, to address uh, infrastructure financing gap uh, that uh, already, uh, I believe, tempering our uh, uh, Indonesian in, uh, economic development. So our government uh, mandate us to address uh, such needs. Uh, I believe approximately 200 billion US dollars infrastructure financing needs. And our government with support of uh, World Bank, uh, Asian Development Banks and uh, DEG, uh, investment company, uh, subsidiary of KFW, uh, a fin in development financial institution from Germany, uh, our government provide us with equity uh, approximately uh, 70, billion, uh, 70 million uh, US dollars to address uh, such needs. It's quite a big uh, infrastructure investment gap. So it's quite a challenging uh, 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 mandates. But now after 13 years, uh, we are able to deliver uh, projects, uh, approximately uh, 52 billion US dollars project, uh, uh, multiplying uh, a multiplier effect maybe about 25.7 times, uh, whereby uh, our assets uh, 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 multiply by maybe 100 times from our establishment for 13 years. Uh, now it's about 7.6 billion. Uh, what's the interesting story also? Uh, we are maybe the only one company in Indonesia that able to provide financing to public sector. Yeah. Uh, uh, 
approximately 30% of our assets are invested into sub-national government municipalities to help them uh, address infrastructure needs. How we can do it? Of course, with a cooperation, not only for with our government, but also with uh, multilaterals and uh, development financial institution. In Indonesia, we are a non-bank financial institution uh, owned by government of Republic Indonesia through Ministry of Finance. Uh, being an NBFI, we are able to provide flexible financing products, not only senior loan, but also uh, subordinate or mezzanine loan, and also equity. Uh, and we can also uh, serve municipal financing uh, with product including uh, uh, conventional loan, Sharia financing, and of course, sustainable financing. That's a theme, uh, that's a, a area that uh, we all understand really important to achieve a net zero uh, target. Uh, we also provide project development and advisory services to help a project owner, including the government. So this is one of our uh, uh, uniqueness, whereby we understand that infrastructure projects, not only lack of financing, but also needs intervention in the preparation area. So we may uh, create a bankable projects that will attract investors, banks to uh, help our uh, infrastructure needs. Uh, with that, we also maintain good relationship uh, both from domestic and international inst institution because we understand that we need help, we need cooperation from uh, uh, many parties to be able to address uh, the project that we need to support. With regards to sustainability, uh, we also uh, have five uh, strategy to address our operations, our uh, activities, so we are able to attract uh, investors and help the project uh, to be more sustainable. Uh, the first uh, principles, of course, we create uh, uh, sustainability principles. We uh, prepare uh, a framework called environmental and social safeguards uh, uh, copying the standards that uh, uh, applied by the muni uh, multilaterals. And these standards was applied uh, through to our, all of our projects. So uh, our project will, will, will have uh, uh, benefits uh, from the principle, the frameworks that we apply. Uh, the second uh, principle, of course, with regards to our operation, we try to contribute from our very own institution to have a, a green office uh, program. So we may operate uh, without, uh, uh, with less uh, emissions, uh, less papers, uh, less stress. So we uh, may uh, be an example to other companies to also uh, follow our operation. Uh, with regards to funding, we also one of the institution that uh, uh, we are the first company that issued a green bond in Indonesia uh, using principles uh, that regulate by our uh, uh, authorities. Uh, we are succeed in issuing uh, such bonds and many companies now following our uh, our initiative and I believe uh, 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 nowadays uh, other institutions also try to issue and move uh, towards uh, more sustainable uh, funding uh, mechanism. Uh, with regards to our products, we also provide uh, sustainable financing uh, through uh, blended finance uh, initiative. Uh, we uh, also uh, help our client to access uh, capital markets, uh, 
through our dairy skin project. So uh, from our financing, we also have a special uh, divisions uh, of, of concentrating in uh, renewable energy projects. Uh, next, we also uh, have uh, one of the uh, our initiative with regards to partnership. Uh, we create a platform called SDG Indonesia One. Uh, it's a blended finance platform uh, established in 2018 for maintaining collaborative uh, action between partners uh, consisting of donors, philanthropists, development bank, commercial bank, who have same uh, understanding and goals in achieving uh, SDG uh, development. Uh, as you may already understand, uh, blended finance is one of the way that uh, we think that it's quite effective to addressing uh, uh, SDG goals. Uh, uh, we have a big uh, needs to uh, to address uh, SDG goals uh, from financing perspective uh, for 2020 uh, till 2024. Uh, the amount is amounting Indonesian rupiah 18 uh, uh, thousand trillion rupiah. So it's really big uh, amount, uh, and the government only able to uh, to tackle approximately 40% uh, of it. And the rest, uh, our government relies to uh, uh, private sectors, investors, uh, and uh, multilaterals. This, the, the financing gap is so big. So the only solution is through uh, blended financing, where, whereby we may attract uh, private sectors to also help uh, our uh, needs. Uh, one of the uh, most important uh, feature of this blended financing uh, 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 instrument are the risk, uh, the risking instrument, whereby uh, to address SDG goals, SDG projects, I believe uh, there are not much uh, bankable project uh, that could be uh, 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 offered to the market. So uh, they need uh, the risking instrument to increase uh, the bankability of the project. Uh, with those kind of needs, so we create a platform uh, called SDG Indonesia One, uh, whereby we provide uh, uh, for uh, facilities, uh, namely development facilities for project development, the, the risking facilities to increase the bankability of the project, financing facilities, this is to provide loans, and also equity fund. Our partnership already reached uh, approximately 35 partners with commitment of 3.19 billion US dollars. Uh, it's the status uh, up to Jul July 2022. Uh, with our SDG Indonesia platform, we already uh, uh, helped 62 projects. Uh, 50, 55 of it are project preparations, and we finance seven projects. Uh, we also have commitment uh, amounting 3.19 billion US dollars. Uh, with realization of 227 new, uh, million US dollars. Uh, with our experience, uh, we may able to uh, finance uh, with cooperation with, uh, uh, one of the example is uh, our cooperation with uh, agency Frenzy Development, AFD, whereby uh, we create a structure to finance a mini hydro uh, projects. Yeah? Uh, as you may know, uh, mini hydro projects in Indonesia uh, have uh, quite a big risk. So we trying to uh, the risk such project with standby uh, uh, guarantee, you may say, provided by the uh, AFD, uh, thereby we can finance 
uh, such project. Uh, these modalities uh, 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 may be replicated, and I believe our uh, uh, sustainable financing division uh, have a lot of mini hydro project uh, uh, copying this uh, structure whereby we have support from the uh, AFD. Uh, with this project, of course, we may address uh, SDG goals number one, no poverty, affordable and clean energy, climate actions, uh, SDG 15, life on land are fulfilled uh, for this project. Uh, with those kind of experience, we believe that uh, cooperation between parties are the key uh, elements to address blended finance. Uh, it's the only way uh, that we can uh, address the needs of uh, SDG goals, financing, also on infrastructure uh, investment needs. And uh, we believe uh, in every transaction, we have to create a local context. Uh, in our experience, using our balance sheet to the risk the project is uh, one of the effective way to create or attracting private sector or investors to Indonesian uh, infrastructure project. Thereby, we have to have a good relationship and sharing experience, sharing ideas, and we thank you, uh, UN Global Compact, to uh, provide uh, these opportunities so we can learn from each other uh, how to effectively uh, attract investor in uh, infrastructure projects and also to achieving uh, sustainable uh, development goals. Uh, thank you for having me and hoping that I can also uh, learn a lot from uh, other participants. Back to you, uh, Ms. Joby, thank you. Thank you very much indeed, Mr. Faris Pranawa, for that very, very important uh, contribution. Um, because of our time, I'm going to ask uh, uh, the other speakers to kindly uh, please uh, uh, shorten their presentation. Thank you very much indeed for that. Indeed, financing is very, very important for the SDGs and also for, the, for infrastructure development. Uh, for the benefit of uh, participants uh, who do not know our local networks, because we are going to now hear from two of our local networks. Uh, Global Compact uh, local networks, networks are business-led. They are multi-stakeholder platforms that work directly with businesses to help them implement the 10 principles of the UN Global Compact and to help to advance sustainable development goals. Our local networks also support both local firms and subsidiaries of multinational companies in implementing the UN Global Compact's uh, 10 principles. Uh, they also help companies in meeting their annual Global Compact reporting requirements, that is uh, communication on progress. Our uh, Global Compact local networks are indeed very, very important to us. So let us now hear from two of our local networks about how this, their initiatives diffuses not only the 10 principles, but also the core values of South-South and Triangular Cooperation. I'm going to yield the floor right now to Mr. Farouk Chauvin, member of the Global Compact's local network board in Bangladesh. He will share his views on private sector engagement in South-South and Triangular Cooperation projects in Bangladesh. So Mr. Chauvin, over to you, thank you. Mr. Soban, I think you are on mute, sir. Uh, thank you, Ms. Makinawa. And uh, it's a pleasure for me to uh, join uh, this panel discussion on responsible business at the forefront of uh, South-South and Triangular Cooperation. Uh, we in Bangladesh uh, have uh, uh, literally from the birth of our country, being uh, strong champions of South-South cooperation. Uh, I myself, exactly 40 years ago, uh, September 1982, I was elected chairman of the group of 77 in New York. And uh, our core uh, 
uh, objective at that time was promoting South-South cooperation. So 40 years later, uh, I'm very happy to, to say that South-South uh, cooperation has made uh, considerable headway. And uh, we in Bangladesh uh, continue to give it uh, the highest importance. Uh, it has now been embedded in our national policy for development cooperation. And uh, access to information, otherwise known as the A to I program in Bangladesh, is currently leading uh, three platforms uh, focused on South South cooperation to facilitate the exchange of knowledge, experience, and best practices and find innovative solutions. Uh, uh, so we have a South South network for public service innovation. We have an alliance for Asian apprenticeship and also a South Asia civil registration network. Uh, we have uh, been happy also to contribute to some of the uh, U UN uh, uh, initiatives, uh, in particular, uh, the UN, uh, the Union Digital Center, the SDG Tracker, uh, to mention uh, some of these. Um, initiatives. So Bangladesh has also laid out its vision uh, on implementing uh, SDGs in the publication South-South Cooperation for Financing uh, SDGs. Uh, in this publication, uh, we have outlined the potential uh, for financing SDGs and in addition, highlighting 48 successful cases uh, within the South uh, <clears throat> that uh, can be followed by other countries uh, in the South. Let me now, uh, because of uh, the shortage of time, uh, which uh, was mentioned by Ms. Makinawa, turn uh, to some uh, uh, specific examples uh, in Bangladesh. Uh, regarding the private sector engagement. South-South uh, uh, cooperation, uh, as we all know, is aligned closely with uh, SDG 17. Uh, and the private sector has been an active uh, partner in the development story of Bangladesh. Uh, uh, as perhaps many of you uh, may be aware, uh, one of the uh, backbones of uh, the economic development of Bangladesh over the last 40 years has been the apparel industry. And here uh, we have now uh, over 100 uh, factories uh, which are regarded as the 100 uh, most sustainable development factories uh, in the apparel sector globally. Uh, so we have uh, focused now on green technology and have uh, in particular uh, uh, tried to showcase these uh, as uh, leading examples uh, for other countries in the South to follow. Uh, let me also make a reference uh, in, within the framework of South-South cooperation. And indeed, uh, this company is... Uh, on the board of uh, uh, the Center for Corporate Social Responsibility in Bangladesh. Uh, this is the, the Young One Corporation. It's a Korean company. Uh, and they have uh, developed uh, what uh, we proudly uh, view as the most eco-friendly economic zone or industrial park in the Asia Pacific region. Uh, this is a, a showpiece. Uh, this 2,500 acre park, uh, they have planted uh, 3 million trees. And what was once uh, swampy land uh, today uh, boasts 18 lakes and 120 species of birds. Uh, one of the most remarkable uh, developments in this eco-friendly park is uh, that uh, they now have the largest rooftop solar power project 
in the Asia Pacific region. And uh, this is a technology which uh, we uh, uh, have shared also uh, with uh, uh, countries in Africa. Uh, it is generating uh, 40 megawatts of solar power. So not only is all the power consumption being met uh, for this economic zone uh, through solar power, but we are also now in a position uh, to supply to the national grid uh, in uh, addition to what is utilized by the economic zone. I mention this because uh, Bangladesh is today in the process of setting up a 100 uh, economic zones. Uh, these are referred to as special economic zones. Uh, and uh, the focus is uh, on green technology and uh, uh, making uh, the most eco-friendly economic zones uh, in the, in the uh, Asia Pacific region. Over the past two years, uh, Global Compact member companies in Bangladesh have also benefited greatly by cooperating and exchanging knowledge with uh, peers from other southern countries in the south, such as uh, Kenya, uh, India, Sri Lanka, and in particular, uh, a number of ASEAN uh, countries, and these include uh, Thailand, Singapore, Malaysia, Indonesia, and, and, and the Philippines, all of whom uh, are also actively engaged uh, in um, a variety of investment projects, uh, either directly related uh, to the apparel sector in Bangladesh or indirectly related. Uh, the other area where we have focused uh, a lot of attention uh, is the IT sector. And here too, uh, Bangladesh has been pioneering, pioneering a number of new uh, technologies focused on the uh, uh, SME sector in particular. SMEs, as you know, uh, play a crucial role uh, in all our uh, countries in the South. And uh, the development of, of SMEs, in particular, the development of uh, uh, women uh, entrepreneurs, uh, we believe, uh, is a critical feature uh, in the development of the, the SME sector. A lot of these uh, enterprises uh, uh, can even now, uh, using uh, information technology and software programs, uh, uh, you can even run a very efficient company uh, out, of the, out of your home. And that is where uh, women can uh, certainly uh, play a major role. Uh, we are very happy that uh, uh, some of our uh, members of the Global Compact in Bangladesh have been recognized for their work and development in uh, the area of sustainable development and, and uh, with the focus on the SDGs. And we have showcased uh, their uh, uh, work uh, at various uh, UN Global Compact uh, meetings. Uh, so uh, with those few words, uh, let me once again uh, thank you for uh, inviting me uh, to be a part of this panel uh, today. Thank you. Thank you very much indeed, Mr. Soban. And uh, also thank you for uh, the 40 years of uh, experience uh, we really appreciate it. Uh, we now yield the floor to Ms. Uh, Christina Cano. Uh, Ms. Cano is the Executive Director of Global Compact Network Paraguay. She'll be sp uh, speaking about uh, the Global Compact Local Network uh, Paraguay's experience in a triangular cooperation project, which involved uh, the local network in Argentina and uh, the Ministry of Industry, Commerce and Tourism of the Government of Spain. So Ms. Uh, Kano, if you can kindly help us limit your presentation to about three minutes, that would be appreciated, given the fact that we we are all, uh, we only have about uh, 10 minutes for this session. Over to you, Ms. Kano. Thank you. Thank you very much for this opportunity. I will really do my best to shorten my, my presentation in, in three minutes. 
Um, it's really um, an honor to be sharing this experience with you, especially to, to bring the experience we had in South America, the other side of the world where we are. Um, so I think it was important because uh, it involved um, two uh, local networks, uh, which is the local network of Paraguay, which I'm, uh, I am the executive uh, director of the local network. And we had the opportunity to develop with these projects, uh, which was financed by a program from the European Commission, which is called uh, Ventana Adelante. I think it was a great experience, not only to work like, directly with another local network, but also to have the opportunity to work with a public institution from Spain. In this case was um, the, the Foreign Trade um, Institute from the Ministry of Industry and Commerce from Spain. And it really uh, was a particular situation because um, in Paraguay, we're one of the biggest um, beef and soy producers and combine that with Argentina, which is also um, uh, a very important, as you all know, um, uh, beef producer as well as we are in Paraguay. And to be able to share this program with one of the countries that is one of the biggest um, importers of our products from South America was really, really um, an original and a very crucial program for us because we had the opportunity to um, share with them the, the knowledge that the European su supply chain, in particular in regards to uh, the due diligence trends in relation to human rights, the environment, but also labor rights. So this was really important because this program gave us the possibility not only to work with participants of our networks, with, which are companies that we are already working development programs integrated into their core business sustainability with the with the root plan of the SDGs, but it also allowed us to work with non-participants of the global compact. So this was really important for us because it allowed us to go a step forward with uh, not only companies that belong to global companies, with companies which didn't have the opportunity not even to hear about sustainability um, criteria or to hear about the SDGs. So we really did uh, a step forward into these companies. So the idea was basically to build capacities into these companies. So through the program, we had the opportunity to work uh, specifically with uh, SMEs from Paraguay and Argentina as well as some of them were also from Spain, but uh, we work um, in uh, really programs and giving them uh, the possibility of building capacities in uh, programs such as human rights or labor rights uh, that allowed us to work into their value change. Through the program, we were able to, um, to work with 75 companies from Argentina and Paraguay and the impact was um, of around 322 uh, participants from these companies uh, participating into the capacity building and the induction to the change of uh, strategic orientation toward really strengthening their, their value change. So um, I think the impact was really important. 75 companies is an important number for us in South America. And, and of course, 322 collaborators from these companies is even more important. So I think it was a fantastic experience because it allowed not only two local networks to work, but as I said before, to have the opportunity to work with a public institution from Spain was also really uh, an important experience for our participants uh, from South America. So I think if uh, really making an effort to put in two minutes uh, the, the most important facts of this program uh, that we are really grateful to the, the European Commission that really financed and gave us the opportunity 
as I said before, to work not only with participant companies from Global Compact, but also with non-participant members. So I think I will stop there just to, to respect the time. <laughs> Thank you very much indeed, Ms. Kano, and my sincere apologies for rushing you, but uh, you gave very good examples. And I hope that uh, the non-UN Global Compact participant company will sign up to the Global Compact through this interaction. At this stage now, I'm going to call on my colleague, uh, Ms. Caitlin Casey. Uh, Caitlin is a Senior Manager for Global Operations at the UN Global Compact. She's going to speak about an exciting initiative that the UN Global Compact has offered to uh, participants. So over to you, colleague uh, Kathleen. Thank you. Thank you so much, Ola Joby, and thanks to all for having me. I think in the quickest interest of time, we'll jump right in. You know, for us at the Global Compact, as we look at the complex and interconnected challenges with situated within the development agenda, we of course see the necessary role that collaboration, cooperation, has to to bring these these um, goals to life. So what we've just been able to do is put together five initiatives that we call accelerators that really aim to challenge and support companies to both act more ambitiously in their own um, development efforts and also to accelerate progress. Um, so we're now um, we've launched five accelerators on climate action, gender equality, um, ambitious goal setting for the SDGs, innovation for the SDGs, and our newest will launch uh, next week on uh, human rights and, and labor rights in, in core business. Um, to date, over the last uh, three years, we've had more than 3,000 companies already take part in these programs, and we're seeing some really exciting outcomes coming out of it, including more than a thousand um, action plans being submitted on gender equality, uh, more than 200 innovative projects to support the SDGs. And one thing that I've been really excited about as a, that's an innovation for us at the Global Compact is seeing regional collaboration through, uh, through and among our local networks. Um, I should have said these accelerators are primarily delivered through our local networks in order to allow us to have the global reach and engagement. And we've now seen a significant collaboration among our ASEAN networks, uh, networks in Africa, networks in Latin America, as Christina very well knows, Bangladesh has also been participating in these collaborations. So we're so excited to see the ways that these um, this cooperation has come, come forward through these accelerators to, to support and challenge businesses to, to take more ambitious action towards sustainable development. Uh, so with that, I'll turn it back over to, to the team. Thank you so much for the opportunity. Thank you very much indeed, um, Caitlin. Regrettably, we do not have time for Q&A this evening. We had planned for it, but we do not have time. But um, you have heard today, uh, particip um, participants you have heard today from the Philippines, from Bangladesh, from Paraguay, and from the UN Global Compact Office on the importance of South-South and Chagula cooperation. This is all about partnerships, about collaboration, about cooperation, and the importance of responsible business. So what you've heard, these are concrete examples of the multidimensional nature of South-South and triangular cooperation. The UN Global Compact, the world's largest corporate sustainability initiative, with our 16,000 participants, 69 local networks and operations in over 80 locations worldwide. We stand ready to support member states, particularly countries of the South, on their path to sustainable development. We are committed to keeping these activities voluntary, state-led, undertaken, by both developed and developing countries. And equally important is the multi, uh, it's, uh, the multi stakeholder nature of the global compact. We thank you very much indeed for listening to us tonight and we look forward to more uh, engagement in the future. So I'd like to thank the panelists and my colleagues also that have helped to organize this event. Thank you very much indeed in the spirit of uh, South-South and triangular cooperation. Thank you.